what a blessing to be here uh, with you. Last time I was here, it was just perspective. We were thinking the possibility. We were thinking, well, maybe you know, this is a bit. I mean, we're all been praying, and I think uh, when we pray and seek the Lord, uh, we wanted it to be a united thing. And it, uh, from our perspective, what we're hearing is both the churches were very united on moving forward that, that, that the call uh, the pastor here would be uh, recognizing me. So my wife uh, with me. I couldn't do ministry. I, couldn't, I, I mean, I could live without her, but I wouldn't want to. <laughs> you know what I mean? I couldn't do what I do in, in the sense to have her support with her prayers. Uh, she's a praying woman. Uh, she's a mother of three. And uh, our two daughters are over here uh, today. Our son is in, in uh, uh, Chattanooga. I was going to think uh, where he works in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Not Southern, but he works in, in the area there. And anyway, so sometime he's over here. But we just want to share a few things uh, with you this morning about uh, the care and keeping of our new pastor and new family. <laughs> <laughs> this is my wife, Julie, for those of you who haven't met her. Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning. On the day that I married my husband, my father-in-law was the one that actually performed the ceremony, tied the knot, and I remember one phrase that he said that day was, we're family now. Well, did I know my father-in-law very well at that point? Not really. No, I didn't know the aunts, aunts and uncles and cousins and um, brothers and sisters. I really didn't know them very well, but we were family. And so that makes me think of what we are right now. We're family, right? We're family. And I am looking forward to getting to know my new aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandmas and cousins and nieces and nephews. Uh, that's going to take some time, but just know I look forward to getting to know each one of you. Now about myself, um, I graduated from Walla Walla College, now university, with my degree in elementary education. But my dream at that point was not to be a classroom teacher, but to do one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And I am a reading specialist. I specialize in teaching people with dyslexia to read and spell. I'm a certified tutor. I have a little business. Um, and most of my students, I tutor online, remotely. So those students just came with me when I transitioned. I saw a couple of students face to face up there in my previous area. I wasn't able to bring them. Their parents wouldn't let them leave. <laughs> but most of my students came with me online. So I'm blessed to be able to work remotely wherever I am. So, um, oh, I really love my work. I have to say that. <laughs> she does. If you want to have a conversation, just ask her about dyslexia. <laughs> <laughs> so about our living situation. Well, you know that, um, well, it sounds like it took a year and a half to um, get a pastoral couple selection. That took a while, longer than you might have expected. Well, then it took a while for us to actually arrive here after the selection Thanks process. to your patience and letting us finish our meetings with Brian McMahon that we just glorified God for. And uh, follow up with that. And now our house. Yet another time-taking thing. <laughs> so my parents, David and Grandma Blutton, have been sharing the property with us for 12 years. My mother, Marilyn, her hand is waving. Everybody gets get to meet her sometime. Um, my father is not here today, but um, anyway, because they live, have lived on the same property with us for I think around 12 years now, a transition for us means a transition for them. And they have been so gracious to uproot and are still uprooted as we get things settled. But when we have their needs and the needs of our family, it, it took a special housing situation. And we kept looking at house after house after house, and there would always be some fatal flaw. <laughs> oh, well, that doesn't, doesn't check it off the list for us. So we looked and looked and looked until well, finally we were able to purchase a house on Orchard Avenue. Um, but it, it checked all the boxes in that there were possibilities. And we are in the midst of remodeling it. For example, it was a good sized family room with a bar in it. And we are in the bar. <laughs> but my parents do need a little kitchen. And so we're remodeling that into a studio apartment for them. Well, that's a process. And a few other things, yeah, we, we 
We found a few other things. Anybody who has done remodeling knows what I'm talking about. Sometimes the, the job grows as you find what's really there under the four layers of linoleum and underlayment. Now, yeah, poor guy says to us, um, this is your first remodel, isn't it? Are you ready to write a big check? So we are in the midst of that right now, and I just want to thank this church for allowing us to stay in the little apartment. Yes, thank you for sure. um, it is such a blessing because then we're able to get this work done while we're not living there. So, oh, we are so, so grateful. Thank you. So it, it, there, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. The reconstruction process is happening. Mostly it's been demolition until now. So. <laughs> That's true. It, it, it's starting. The work is starting. <laughs> anyway, so every part of this transition has taken time, and it's still taking time. So, as I said, we're family now, right? Every once in a while, a family might need to come together and have a family council, right? We've got something to talk about. Yeah, it's a good thing to have a family council. So I'm going to call a family council right now. Is that okay? Family counseling session. <laughs> All right, relationships are important in the family of God. You agree? Really important. They're important to God, they're important to us. So I'm going to start with a story. Um, my daughter Sarah has a little black dog named Buddy. He's just a little guy, well, starting from here. <laughs> Just a little guy, and I was walk where we lived at the time. I would walk with him around a loop in our neighborhood at six o'clock every morning. And for me, it was a great decision. I was walking the dog. I was getting fresh air and exercise, spending time with the Lord. I was as I was walking. That was a great idea to be out there. Well, one time on my walk around the loop, I was met by a very unhappy woman. And she told me how my walking was affecting her life. And, and, no, it's not funny. I know it sounds funny, but every morning I'd walk by with my dog, and her dogs inside the house would, would notice and start barking and wake up her children. Every morning I was doing this to her. I didn't realize how what I was doing was affecting her. Thankfully, she came out to tell me. Was it a blessing that she came out to tell me? It was a huge blessing. So that I want to use that as an illustration. That, you know, in a family, along the way, there might be disagreements or misunderstandings. Communication is not a perfect thing. The communicators are not perfect, are they? No, none of us are. I wish Anna, I wish Anna and I could stand up here and tell you we're perfect. But we're not. Sorry. <laughs> We are growing. That is absolutely right. We are growing. So I want to ask you a favor right here in this family council to start things out. If Dan or I say or do something that comes across either to you or to someone you know as hurtful or confusing or it came across wrong, it would be a huge blessing if you would come to us and share that. Now, two, two things might happen. One might be just like that poor lady that I was waking up her children every day. Maybe we'll just understand how we impacted you. Like, oh, thank you. I can see how that is. Thank you for telling me. I get it. Or sometimes maybe there'll just have to be a little communication. To a clarification. Oh, okay, well, that makes sense. Sometimes we might have done something wrong and we go, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I appreciate you telling us and we apologize. So I, I know it's a hard thing to come to people because you never know how things are going to come across, right? You never know how you'll be received, what will happen. But Dan and I want to give you an open invitation to come and talk to us because we want to hear your experience. We want to hear your perspective, and we don't want those little miscommunications, misunderstandings to get in the way of our relationship. Does that make sense? Amen. All right. And it'd be easy for you to assume that I know that I hurt your feelings. I can't read your mind, and so sometimes I might say something that's sensitive, and I certainly don't want to do that. You know, I want to affirm you and grow you in the Lord as I'm growing in the Lord. And so that's really important to us. 
and a commitment that we make back to you. Is if you offend us or hurt our feelings, we're not going to be in that sort of thing. But as far as we, we want to come to you and say, well, Mike, you know, there's an issue here. I think we work it through. I, I have no, I have full confidence in Mike and I can work it through. You know, so that's that's the commitment in both ways. That's what a relationship, a healthy relationship, uh, looks like. And so that's the kind of relationship we want to have with each one of you. Amen. And we have one more request here to conclude this family council. And that is the request that we pray for each other. We'll be praying for you. Please pray for us, all of us. We need the prayers in the family of God. And as we draw close to God in prayer, he will draw us close to each other. Thank you. really beautiful this morning because Ella came to our door, knocked on the door, I was in disposed at the moment, not available, whatever, but we <laughs> met her at the door, and uh, it's a small apartment, <laughs> but anyway, so we met her at the door, and Ella prayed for us today, for the new family here, and so that, that was a true blessing, and then to have uh, Glenn grab me and the, the worship leaders, that's, that's pretty normal, but I like it, they go and pray together, because it, it's not about us and us trying to be great, it's about him, and when to be to him and used by him, whether it be in a worship service, Sabbath school, service opportunities. Um, anyway, we're just excited to be here and to be joining you uh, in ministry. And as you know, we leave a family, we leave four families behind, if you will, in our previous district. So please pray for them. I believe the next staff that will be, uh, will be visiting in person and may become their pastor. And so pray for him, because four churches can, can be a challenge, as they know from personal experience. That's two churches can be unsure. But I just want you to know several things. I think I mentioned this when I was here last time, but some of you weren't here. And one of the things is I like to build leadership teams, and I like to work with leaders. I am not a dictator, not who I want to be. Not I come across that way sometimes when I say something. I don't want to be that way, but I want to work together with our leadership team, with each one of you, uh, to accomplish the mission that God has for us here. We have something good that's going here. And we want, I don't want to come in, nor does my wife want to come in and mess that up. We want to come in and strengthen you, hold up your hands, and you hold up our hands in ministry, and to reach people for Christ. Clark, is that you out here? It is in Pearl Turkey. Wonderful. Good to see you. It's been a lot of years, hasn't it, since we sat in the same <laughs> sanctuary together. But thank you for being here. It's a blessing to see you. So I'm a team player. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And, and we already talked about being approachable. But I like to visit uh, people in their homes. And sometimes it's appropriate to visit someone in their workplace as well. And I'll, I'll explore that with you. I'm not just going to show up and you're going to know what to do with them. You know, but that's my view used to be an orchardist, right? So that I would go out and visit you and, and you know, walk up on the or whatever. You know, you probably put me to work too, I'm guessing. So we worked together well yesterday, uh, and that was a tremendous blessing. It's, it's really important to, to my wife and to me. Uh, and I love this church because what I see already uh, is children involved in the worship service. And I think children need to be involved in every aspect because they're not the future of the church that are present. It will affect the future. But if we don't engage them now and they're not a essential part of who we are, that's what I love about what's happening in Eastman Amchi today. There are young people that are preaching. There are young people that are serving. And yesterday, some of you don't know, was it 12? You can remember, Jenny. Was it about 12 young people that came? And they worked hard. I mean, Richard and I could have worked all day, and then some, <laughs> and uh, still not got accomplished what they accomplished. And so well, that was a blessing. So investing in young people and seeing them preach. I've had individuals, young people that I've worked with that want to preach. And so I work with them and other residents will work with them to prepare them so they can preach and music. So beautiful things that, that I see happening here already. And we're looking forward to continuing to build up the kingdom of God together. Father, we just we bow before you. We recognize that this is a new beginning. Uh, prayer already was made uh, for it as we're moving forward. But I'm just asking that your Holy Spirit would speak through me today. Help me have ears to hear and, and voice to speak. And the individuals here would hear your words this morning. We'd be challenged to grow deeper with Jesus and to let you work through us to save souls for his kingdom. In your kingdom, in Jesus' name. So the Pharisees were great debaters. 
uh, arguments often erupted amongst them. Uh, then you get the, you know, just talking about different things. And you have the Sanhedrin that would come together. They had different views. And so they would talk and argue. And one of the questions that they had was, if the chicken laid an egg on the Sabbath, is it right or wrong to eat? Some would say, absolutely yes. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Others would say, definitely not. And the reason one group argued you should not eat an egg was because the chicken had worked on the Sabbath, and therefore it was God's rest day, so he would be breaking the Sabbath if he were to eat that egg. So I don't know what you're supposed to do with the egg, but anyway. <laughs> Another critical question was, how far is the Sabbath journey? Some say an eighth of a mile, and any more is a violation of God's holy law, his principles. Yet if you take your ingredients on Friday afternoon, somewhere, then you can walk to that place if you want to go another eighth of a mile. And I presume you can go back home. I don't know about that. One of the red hot issues of debate revolved around the question of who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And they would say, well, certainly no non-Jew. Right? Come on. They're, they're, they're built. What about uneducated Jews or poor Jews or illiterate Jews? What about Jews that were non pharisees what about Jews in another social class? In that timeless story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus answers this question for us. The story, you, you, you've read it before. <laughs> you, you've read part of it today, kind of where it ends there. But there's an invitation here, actually a directive from Jesus, that I don't want you to miss. I want you to hear the question, and then I want you to hear his answer and what he would have you to do what we have a need uh, to do. So just starting here in chapter uh, 10, oh, wait a minute, I've got the wrong place. Here. Yeah, it's chapter 10, 10, verse 25. And behold, a certain law, your lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And so he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with, sorry, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, amen, for sure. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Can you think of anything more important than loving Him? And if you love Him and experience His love, then you're naturally going to share that uh, with your neighbor, because that's what God does when He takes a willing heart like yours. Like Looking for a loophole here, the scholar, student of divine law, asked, but who is my neighbor? Just how would you define neighbor? Now, give, me, give me a little bit more information. You know how they were trying to trick him and didn't say different things. There was some genuineness, I think, in this question here, and Jesus responded with a story. And just, just so you don't, I mean, you think parables, right? Parables, the uh, that's what some people refer to it as, and it is. It teaches a lesson. But this was no imaginary scene, but an actual occurrence, which was known to be exactly as represented by Jesus. The priest and the Levite who had passed by on the other side, listen to this, were in the company listening to Christ's voice. Can you imagine being there in this story, being told about you and your guilt? I mean, it point them out. For sure. But he responded. And he said, a certain man went from Jerusalem to Jericho. Verse 30. Now Jerusalem is about 2,300 feet above sea level. And Jericho is 1,300 feet um, below sea level. So in a span of 21 miles, the road drops 3,600 feet. That's pretty impressive. In the days that Jesus was on the earth, it was a narrow rocky road. with sharp turn reported by rocky uh, passes and deep ravines. There were many hiding places for desperados and robbers. Even late as the 5th century, Jerome called it the Bloody Way. Not a place you probably want to be going in the days prior to an end. But a certain man went down the road, a Jewish peddler went down the road, and as he walked, the shadows of the night were coming on. You could question why he was there, but he was there. He hears footsteps behind him. Rough hands grabbed him. Throw him to the ground and beat him. Punch him in the face. 
bones are broken, he's kicked, his eyes are blackened, nose bloody, his teeth are knocked out. They stole his clothes and left him half dead. His bruised and bleeding there on that road. In your mind's eye, you see him in a pool of blood, crying in agony. Do you hear him crying for help? Do you feel his pain? Now, I've had pain. I've experienced pain in my life. Now, I'm not sure all the times that I have at this moment. But I remember one time I was playing with some kids. Softball at school. I, I figure when I'm playing with kids, then when I do a worship, she listen because they know Pastor Danny cares about them. So we play together, we pray together, we do worship together, we stay together. Anyway, so I take off for first base. I just, you know, you just pump the ball out. You're playing with kids, you know. You can, you know. They were young kids. And so I saw this one seventh grader, and he got the ball, and he was going to throw me out. Well, that's just not going to happen. So, so, now if I looked at first base, I would have seen, at first base, I would have seen, um, I think it was a third grader. Well, there's no way they were going to touch that ball. So I didn't need to run, I could have just walked backwards, even, and got there safely, I think. But instead, I took off. And one, rip, two, rip, both of my hamstrings. I'm, I'm, I'm a third less on each side. <laughs> Both broke, and I landed on my chest, and you know, if you land on your chest, you're gasping for air. So I don't know if this man, I mean, he's been through a lot more than I just went through. I had to literally drag myself. In fact, the woman school leader there said, she thought it was being funny, you know, joking. She said, oh no, I think he's really hurt. <laughs> and I had to drag myself. She drove her car over on the lawn, where you weren't supposed to drive. Right? But I crawled into her car, and she took me to the yellow. And told me for answers. That was helpful. They gave some pain medication. That was helpful. But so this man here, lying there with his hope, is gone, right? Because he's out there. Nobody's coming by other than others that are going to rob and steal. Nobody else is going to be foolish enough to come by at that time of day. So notice some clear facts about the priest that comes along in verse 31. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. Oh, well, luckily, how, how much fortune can you have than to have a priest come down that way? Because they know they're supposed to help people. They teach people to help people. And notice these clear facts. Again, the Bible says, by chance, the priest came that way. And I would say, by divine chance, he came by that way. It was no accident. God arranged for the priest to be in the right place at the right time. He was a tithe king health-reforming, Sabbath-keeping priest, a conservative Adventist priest, if you will, but his value system was, value system was mixed up. His priorities were confused. You ever been there? Your priorities were confused? He was more interested in meticulously keeping the Sabbath, and Sabbath-keeping is keeping important. We'll talk about that in a minute. He was scrupulously guarding his health and analyzing, paying his tithe. He wanted to make sure he got exactly right. Not too much, but this is exactly right. So he would get his tithe and find his ticket. Places. The tragedy of the priest is he had the opportunity, he had the means, he had the opportunity, because you know they were doing pretty well financially, priests at that point, and the ability to save a life that he didn't see. God put him in the right place at the right time to make a difference, but he didn't. He missed his opportunity. He failed to do what he could do. When he saw him, the word says he angled across to the other side of the trail and kept going. Leading him in to God. What a loser, right? I mean, what kind of a priest does this? Now, wait a minute. Don't be too quick to judge. Look in the mirror before you judge characters in Scripture, before you judge people in Scripture, or anyone for that matter. I was driving along in my car, and I was a teenager, and I'm not making excuses, but I was driving along in my car and watching this Jeep in front of me, and I thought, that's a nice little Jeep, just a, you know, Wrangler. And he's driving along, and all of a sudden he goes off in the ditch and rolls into his Jeep. Now, in my defense, there are a bunch of cars behind me, right? I just kept driving. Now, today, I don't know, I mean, I'm a nursing assistant, I've done some basic first aid, you know, classes I've taken them, etc. I would go there and assist any way that I could, assist anyone, call, whatever. We didn't have cell phones back then. Um, so, but I drove on by. And so, don't be too quick to judge the priest in this story. I'm ashamed of that reality. In fact, my dad didn't know about that until Sabbath. He never heard that I drove by 
And it wasn't my fault, I didn't cause the accident. Other people I could see were stopping. So I could justify all day long, but the reality is I went on why. I had no idea where I was going. I mean, I was, I was in college, young college student, you know, but I had more important things to do or didn't want to face whatever was there and I rolled over a vehicle. So don't judge the priest here too quickly. Learn from the priest. And that's what I'm choosing to do today. One of the tragedies of Judaism is that many Jews believe that the sum of religion consisted in regulations and loyalty to a set of rules, a checklist, if you will. Instead of seeing each of God's commands and principles for life, producing loving people who attract the world to God, they had these checklists that they had to accomplish. They were there at the crossroads of humanity. Like we are. We were right at the crossroads of humanity. And people can come to know Jesus through you, through your example. And it's true. A lot of times you don't have to speak. You just be. That's true. But there are times to speak. We can't be quiet in this generation uh, today. We need to be willing to speak. And they were right there, and they missed the opportunity. The Messiah came. Can you believe that? Jesus Christ, the righteous one himself, who made all of forward to all their feasts and everything, looked forward to his coming. And he came. And they rejected him. I love you before you misunderstand me. Health reform certainly has a purpose. God wants us to be healthy. He wants us to have healthy minds and bodies. Absolutely. But I am not saved by what I don't eat or by what I do eat. I am saved by the of Jesus Christ who died for me. And really, health reform is the purpose of that. I believe it's to make me more of a loving Christian. To make me a more loving that's the purpose of health reform. And the health reform reforms us. I don't need to take you on for and say, okay, Crystal, you're doing this wrong. But by my example, and you see my, my, my health get better, and you're like, what well, dance do You know, we can teach things, share things. But condemning people, I don't know about you, but when I'm condemned, I don't want to hear what you have to say. If you're just condemning me as a negative person, whereas if you share with me and say, this is my testimony, this is what I did, and, and these things helped me in my health and restored me to health and allowed me to continue living. Some of you are here today alive because of the health reform and changes that you've made in your life. Now I'm getting off into preaching that. But Sabbath keeping. It's not for you to judge someone else and say, oh, oh, oh look what they're doing on the Sabbath. No, Sabbath keeping is such a beautiful thing because it helps us remember that we are God's kids, that He is our Creator, that He is good. It's a promise that Eden will be restored. It reminds us of our Creator and our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Tithing. Is that why tithe? So that Stephen can check off and say, yep, Dan tithe this month. Looks like an honest tithe. I know he doesn't do that. But the reality is, is that why I do it? So I can impress him, or impress the conference, or impress you all because I tithe. No, I tithe because it strangles selfishness. We become selfless when we give to God everything. I don't want to just give him 10% plus my offerings. I want to give him everything that I can. In the house that we're remodeling, I mean, I, I thought we were just putting an area on mom and dad and converting that area to their living center. But instead, it's into leaking into our kitchen now, literally, because there was a leak. But I'll tell you if you want to hear more about that another time. Verse 31. One more thing on tithe. We bring our tithe into the storehouse, which I believe is not from ministry over there or there. I mean, you're a Seventh day Adventist Christian. The tithe is the storehouse, which is your local church. That's where my tithe is going to be returned. I'm not going to return it to Amazing Facts. I love Amazing Facts. A wonderful ministry. I'm not going to return it to University Church in uh, um, Michigan, you know, because I love White House because he's retired now. A friend of mine now is the pastor there. No, I'm going to return my tithe to my local church. So, when the priest saw him, he passed by on the other side. The word saw is blameless. He paid no attention. Can you imagine? He paid no attention to him. Not worth my time. So what is a human being worth? It's not just skin and bone. You're created. You are created and fashioned in the image of God. He created you. So don't let anybody tell you that you're not valuable. 
Don't let anybody reduce you to something you're not. You are a child of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And you shouldn't be saying amen to that because that's wonderful, right? Ralph, but praise the Lord. You are a child of the living God. What a blessing. You are super valuable. And the devil wants to be you. The devil wants to discourage you. But don't let him do it. Look to Jesus and live. And look to him for hope and for wholeness. You're created and loved by God. There was a little girl trying to photocop herself on this photo, this color photocop here. And so she's getting on top of your picture, and she's getting on top of this, trying to get in there so she can get a photocopy of herself. But we can't produce people that way. I would like to reproduce some people, though, <laughs> because they're just so loving and kind and inspiring. We need more and more of those. And as we come closer to Jesus, that's who you, that's who I will be more and more reflections of his character, his goodness. So the priest could have made a difference in the life of another. He had the opportunity, but he squandered it. He was too busy. He was too uppity up to be of help there. He was born for that moment. And the reality is you were born for this moment today. We are here together, not by accident. I believe God isn't working in my life, and he's working in your lives. Be open to what he has for you, to continue to grow, to continue to live your Christian life, so that others might have peace. As you have peace. Isn't it wonderful we can confess our sins directly to God? I'm so thankful that you don't have to come to me and confess your sins. There's a time you know, where we have to share and we encourage each other and, and, and provide support for victory, that sort of thing. I'm thankful we can go directly to God and confess our sins. And He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from how much unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. Hallelujah. So the Levite, we won't spend much time on him, but we're going to talk about him again here in verse 32. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at that place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. He looked, he gazed, he thought, considered briefly. It's a little risky. One has to be careful and weigh one's priorities because I'm needed in the next town, so I better take care of that. But the noble impulse to help was strangled at birth. This religious man showed up, but he also avoided the man. The commitment demanded was too great. Because, you know, I just got a new problem. Or whatever it is that she was. That man's all bloody, I'm gonna get all bloody, you know? It's interesting, neither of them seem to have an animal if you don't care if they did. So they're walking, right? They said they were walking the ankles. They didn't have animals. Jesus' life. And that's what I love about Jesus. He's a shining example of commitment to others for their salvation. He did whatever he could do to save each individual. He's still doing it through his spirit to reach one of you, to reach people for the kingdom. How do you define commitment? I mean, commitment is a choice we make. We commit to something. If we're getting married, we commit to something. When we went through this pastoral search process, we committed to Christ and say, Lord, guide us in this process. And then we come together and we commit to each other to building up his kingdom and his heart. Commitment is a Swedish position, working all day at busy practice and spending three nights a week in health evangelism in Stockholm. Wow, that's inspiring. And you know how busy positions are. We have at least one or two here, I think. Uh, it's a busy life. It's a busy life. But the key is following through on whatever it is that God leads you to do. Keeping the balance in that process, but honoring Him. Commitment is an 11 year old boy coming up to his pastor after a wonderful sermon on reaching others for Jesus. And he hands his savings for his model airplane to the pastor and says, Use this to reach people. That's commitment. Commitment is a Polish elder going to his pastor and saying, Pastor, I've waited, I've saved for three years for a car, and I know that you need one. Here are the keys. Go administer the churches that you have. God will provide for me another way. Wow, what an amazing thing. I'm not suggesting you do that. I have enough cars. Of course, I have two daughters, but those daughters have cars. Anyway, so we don't need to get any cars. But the point is, you're and putting God first. Commitment is a little, slender, uneducated lady making Billy Graham's ministry the object of her prayer life. And praying for him for 30 years, organizing prayer men, praying for him. There's a wonderful hymn in this book that we'll sing together on church sometime. I need the prayers, or we need the prayers of those who love. It's 
truth. And whatever you think of Billy Graham, a lot of people came to know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Amen. Yes, amen. Praise the Lord. I'm thankful for that. So then we have verse 33. We get quick now. We're not going to this is or this part. Verse 33. The other is kind of like a reflective time. Like, oh, I can see myself in the priest. Oh, I can see myself in the Levite. But then we go on here to verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. A Samaritan. How did the Jews look upon Samaritans? With the state, for sure, for sure. And there are reasons, there are reasons, you can argue and make reasons for anybody for treating somebody with the state. But I don't see Jesus treating people with the state. I see Jesus treating people with love and kindness and goodness. So verse 33, he came where he was. Doesn't look like he had to think about it very long. He could see the man was dying. And when he saw him, he had what? Compassion on him. He had compassion on him. Unlike the other two, he draws close. He cradles the man in his arms. Blood all over his own clothes. Binds up his wounds. What do you think he's binding up his wounds with? Probably parts of his clothes. He pours oil and wine. I don't know what the purpose of that oil and wine was. Maybe he was a businessman. I don't know. He want to sell it. We don't know. But he uses it to help this man. He places him on his donkey and brings him to the end of safety. And here's a guy that's looked upon with this day. But who is my neighbor? He seemed to get it. He understood it. Because this wasn't another Samaritan he was helping. This is a Jewish man that he was helping. And if that wasn't enough, you say, good for you, man. You took him to the end of safety. He's getting healthy. And you're, 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 he took care of him through the night. That's good. It's one thing to check him into the hospital and say, okay, see ya. But he took care of him. And then when he left, what do you see? It's verse 30, um, 3, 4. He says, So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring out oil, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an end, to an end, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave him to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him. So he didn't just take care of him, just kind of get him on his feet a little bit. He said, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. He made full provision. Sounds like someone else that we know that made full provision for each one of us. Not just for our physical healing, which he has, right? Through time, you see in your life, I was brought to miracles and things like that. But your spiritual wholeness and healing. Amen. He provides. Amen. Amen. That must be time to quit, right? <laughs> so the story is clearly a parable of the gospel. In this story that took place, Jesus is using it to teach. And the question is, are you having ears to hear this morning? I hope you are. I must see. John 10.10 10 tells us that the thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. Do you see the thief working? Do you see the devil working? Do you want to be an agent of Satan? In the church? Because there are agents of Satan in the church. Sometimes when we get our lives focused on me, uh, focus on something other than Jesus, we start fighting. And we start finding reasons to, oh yeah, you heard this about so and so? You know, watch your prayer requests. You gotta be careful with those. The smaller the group, the <laughs> better. In fact, some prayers you just need to pray for yourself for that person. And sometimes you need to, if you care about them, to go with go to them and share it and just tell them they're you're there to support them and you're praying. As it can become a gossip session, sometimes prayer sessions can become. And you have to remember, if you almost when you're sharing a prayer concern, I'm just getting on a little bit on subject, but not really. When you're sharing a prayer concern, think about the fact that this person's sitting there right there with you. You might say it a little bit different. You might say, rather than pray for her who just lost his way, you might say, sorry, you're, you're my best nice pick up, right? So, so. Uh, you know, instead, uh, I lost that. Um, where was my thoughts? I'm bringing around. Where lost his way? Yeah. Instead of saying where lost his way, say, you know, let's pray for Virgil. Pray for him. He needs some encouragement right now. And if you were sitting there listening, go, yeah, thank you. I need encouragement. I need your prayers. 
But if you go into all the detail about what's going on in Virgil's life, all of a sudden you move from praying and prayer concern to gossip. I have a message on that. We'll get back to that one. But just this, yeah, guard, guard others. Because you can so easily hurt them and put them in a place where they never want to come back here or never want to be in your presence. That would be horrible. Satan has left us bruised and bleeding on the highway of life. Wounded. Marital difficulties. Marriages that are struggling. You know, all the demands. If you've got little children or you're meeting children or grown-up children like I do, just all the demands of life. Marriage is... Anybody that says marriage is easy. Anyway, this is not true. Marriage is challenging at times. But I'm thankful that Julie and I have worked through the challenges. And she's been more patient than I had to be. Because she lives with me. And I've had health issues in the past, and I'm really thankful that she was there for me. I wonder if other women would have stayed with me. But she did it because she's a praying woman. She loves the Lord. So wounded, children gone astray, they left the church. Maybe they disowned you. Maybe you disowned them because they did something you were embarrassed of. When your children do something that's foolish, love them. They know they did wrong. You don't, I mean, I'm with her little. I mean, obviously, you're training them up the way they should go. I'm, I'm more in the adult children stage right now. And so, love on them. They know what I think, what I believe. But I want to be there for my girls. I want to be there for my son. Regardless of what choices they make. And like, that's the case for anybody. When did a spouse die? My mom died five years ago. Sorry. Um, and she left my dad alone. And no one. They eat breakfast quick. And in almost 60 years, they had together. So some of you can relate to that. Your spouse has passed away. Maybe you're remarried, maybe you're still single. They stop. They stop. Because you miss them. Even though they might have been adopted in some areas of your life, you still love them and care for them. Wounded, financial difficulties, there's crisis in your business. Maybe you lose your job. And you go, how am I going to feed these kids? How am I going to pay the rent? How am I going to do this? Whatever. How about a sense of frustration that you may have at work because you don't like your boss? And what I think I'd like to tell you is just do it as unto the Lord. Even if the guy's a jerk. I mean, if you can move on, great. But if you're kind of there, just be a witness for Christ. Wounded. You can't control your temper. You have a sense of failure and frustration in different areas of your life. Maybe you struggle with purity issues. Maybe you struggle with another person that you shouldn't be with that you're with. That needs to stop, right? If you're out, if you're in a relationship, when you're very wrong in a relationship is inappropriate with someone of the opposite sex or same sex, obviously, that needs to stop. For God's glory. There is one, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who comes near. He comes near to you. And he sees you broken. And you know, we deserve it. We deserve to be eaten to turn to give it to us. And just tell us how stupid we are and how good we think. But instead, he comes there. You're broken on the road of life, and he comes there, and he takes care of you. In fact, he went beyond that. He didn't just take care of you. He died in your place. He died in my place. For God so loved each one of us, his one and only son. Why did Jesus tell this story? Who is my neighbor? The question is answered clearly. And do you think this guy that he asked him the question wants to answer? The question, honestly? <laughs> well, we'll get to that. So here we go. We're getting there now. Um, so he says, Jesus, to this man, which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Now he answered this question. He said, he who showed mercy. He didn't say the Samaritan. <laughs> he just said, he who showed mercy on him. And then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. I don't know if you've read the book, What's So Amazing About Grace, but there's a couple paragraphs I just have to share with you. Oh, I skipped over this one. Let's go to this one. This one here. Page 503 of a wonderful book on the life of Christ, The Desire of Ages. If you haven't read it, if you don't have a copy of it, let me know. If anyone, uh, the leaders know here, and we're getting a copy. It's a wonderful uh, book on the life of Christ. 
500 degrees. Okay, he didn't talk about this, and it, he makes it clear that this was not just a parable. This was, it didn't happen. This is based on a true story that was being shared. But listen to this here. The story ended in Jesus fixed his eyes upon the water in a glance that seemed to read his very soul and said, Which of these three thinkest thou true neighbor of him that fell among the robbers? The lawyer would not, even now, take the name Samaritan upon his lips. And he answered, He who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said, Go and do thou likewise. Thus she goes on to question, uh, Who is my neighbor is forever answered. Christ has shown that our neighbor does not mean merely one of the church or faith of which we belong. It has no reference to race, color, or class distinction. Our neighbor is every person who needs our help. Our neighbor is every soul who is wounded and bruised by the adversary. Our neighbor is everyone who is the property of God. Amen. Amen. In the story, I said to you, this is the third one. In the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus gave a picture of himself and his mission. Man had been deceived, bruised, robbed, and ruined by Satan, and left to perish. But the Savior had compassion on our helpless condition. He left his glory to come to our rescue. He found us ready to die, and he undertook our case. He healed our wounds. He covered us with his robe of righteousness. He opened to us a refuge of safety and made complete provision for us Amen. at his own charges. He died to redeem us. Pointing to his own example, he says to his followers, these things I command you, that ye love one another. And this quote that I promised you as well, from who, what's so amazing about grace by Philip Yancey, he says, from mercy school onward, we are taught how to succeed in the world of ungrace. The early bird gets the word, no pain, no gain. There is no such thing as a free lunch. Demand your rights. Get what you pay for. I know these rules, he says, because I live by them. I work for what I earn. I like to win. I insist on my rights. No American, right? I insist on my rights. I want people to get what they deserve. Nothing more, nothing less. Listen to this. Yet if I care to listen, I hear the loud whisper from the gospel that I did not get what I deserved. I deserve punishment, and I got forgiveness. I deserve wrath, and not love. I deserved a debtor's prison, and God instead a clean credit history. I deserved stern lectures and crawl on your knees repentance, and I got a banquet spread before me. God is so different than what comes natural to you. And to me. Now I'm going to end with a story here. The title of the story. The sermon title, Make Me Like Joe. A drunk was miraculously converted at a mission. Prior to his conversion, Joe had gained the reputation of being a dirty wino for whom there was no hope. Only a miserable existence in the ghetto. But following his conversion to a new life of Christ, everything changed. Joe became the most caring person that anyone associated with the mission had ever known. Joe spent his days and nights hanging out at the mission, doing whatever he needed, whatever needed to be done. There was never any task that was too lowly for Joe to take on. There was never anything that he was asked to do that he considered beneath himself. Whether it was cleaning up the vomit left by some violently sick alcoholic, or scrubbing the toilets after careless men <laughs> the bathroom filthy. What makes you do that too? <laughs> Joe did what was asked with a soft smile on his face <laughs> and with a seemingly gratitude for a chance just to help someone else. He could be counted on to feed feeble men that couldn't feed themselves. And he would help unfold them and wash them and put them in a clean bed. One evening when the director of the mission was delivering the, the message, Lifting up Jesus. Of course, they had to hear the preaching first before they could do the eating. <laughs> I've been in gospel missions, that's how it works. Um, but the director was preaching, lifting up Jesus, and invited people to accept Jesus as their Savior and as their Lord. And only one man responded to his call. And this repentant drunk, and should we call him that anymore? When he becomes 
victorious when he accepts Jesus as his Savior? Is he a drunk anymore? Now, he may struggle and have issues and challenges that are going on, but we don't label him by that. You're a child of the living God. So listen to this. What this man kept saying over and over again, Oh God, make me like Job. Make me like Job. Please make me like Job. Make me like Job. And the preacher's up there going, I've got to correct this guy. I mean, Job, who's Job? And he said, son, I think it would be better if you would say, Lord, God, please make me like Jesus. And the question that the man asked, he said, is he like Job? <laughs> not Job. So Jesus leaves us here at the end of this story as he's sharing here. He doesn't share things by accident. He shares things purposefully. Jesus has a question. And then a command. Maybe you don't like commands. <laughs> when you love Jesus, if you love him, I just says, keep my commands. Because we have a love relationship. So verses 36 and 37 again challenge you, because our scripture reading today, and it challenges me. So which of these three do you think was my neighbor to him who fell upon the thieves? Among the thieves. And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said, Go and do life. Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Jesus has given you clear direction. Who your neighbor is, but just anyone that's hurting, that he places in your path, that you can be of help to. You can pray and ask for wisdom. Obviously, there's enabling people to continue on in life of sin. You don't want to be enabling people, but you want to be loving people and helping them in your desperate situation. Perhaps not even a desperate situation. So Jesus says, who? The question that he answers, who is my neighbor? And then he says to you, you can go and do likewise as this man did. And you've got the glory. And let's pray together. If you'd like to join me in healing, uh, you're welcome to do that. Oh. Heavenly Father, this is to be a house of prayer. Okay, we don't have a dedicated sanctuary, a multi-purpose room here, but a sanctuary is coming. We know that. But this space, this is sacred space where we're here together. And we choose to look to you and find hope and wholeness. And as you have cleansed us, if you've made us clean, we can be a blessing to others and show them the way to you. And you can make them clean. So Lord, please, be with each one of us. Don't let us leave this place to say, well, it was an interesting message. I like the pastor. Who cares if like the pastor now? We love Jesus. And if we love Jesus, Lord, help us to walk away changed from here. And as we see situations where we can make an impact, help us to do that. Even if we're kids, we can say, Mom and Dad, can we help that man? Thank you, Jesus, for hearing our prayer. And help us to go and have mercy and to love and to care for people that they might know the living Christ as well. And you say, Amen.